Welcome to this predicted paper from OnMaths that is based on the advanced information given to us by the exam boards. Please use this paper in addition to your other revision. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMaths site. OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing. So to find the um, probability we're going to do the successful outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. So looking at this question it says it, number of times it should land on a 1 so that would be 1 over the total amount which is 11. So the chance of us getting a 1 is 1 over 11. To find the expected amount, we do the probability and we times it by the amount of trials. So it says it's spun 60 times, so we times it by 60. And that will give us the answer of 5.454 blah blah blah. Now it can't have landed on a 1 5.4 times. So it's definitely, well, this probability, we always round down. So never ever round up because it's five times um, and then a little bit extra. And so only when it gets to six can we say that it's six times. So the answer to this is just five. So we've just got to go around this two-way table filling in what we can. Um, so if we look here, the uh, total amount completely is 25, so it's 25 students, and the total who said yes is 17. So if we take the 17 away from the 25, that leaves us 8. So 8 must have said no. Then same thing with here. Um, there are um, 17 in total who said yes, 12 picked salad, and so therefore we take the 12 away from the 17 and we get 5. And so the total for the pizza is, will be 6. And then 6 plus 19 is 25. So we've got this bit along here. And then 12 plus 7 is 19. And we can check that as well. 1 plus 7 equals 8. So we know we've got it right. To answer this question, we need to cut this shape into two shapes. So we're going to draw a line across here. And we're going to cut it into a rectangle and a triangle. Now we need to first of all label the um, parts of the triangle. So the length or the width of the triangle, the base, will be the same as the base at the bottom, so that will be 20 centimeters. And we need to find the height, which is this length here, which is 90, degree, 90 degrees to the base. And to find that, what, what we can look at is the fact that the total height of the whole thing is 13, and the bit the height of the bit we don't want is 11. So what's left over? Well, 2 centimetres will be left over. So the height will be 2 centimetres of the triangle. So let's work out the area of the triangle first. Which is going to be half times base times height. Half times the base, which is 20, times the height, which is 2 will just give us 20. Now let's work out the area of the rectangle. And that's just going to be the width times the length. Width is 20. The length is 11. So that would be 220. Then to work out the total area of the whole thing, we're just going to do, add those together. So 220 plus 20, which is 240. The units are all in centimetres, and so the area units will be centimetres squared. All probabilities have to add up to 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away these probabilities away from 1. So I'm going to do 1 take away 0 0.09 plus 0 0.13 plus 0.18 and so that's going to be 0.4 one take away 0.4 is 0.6 
the first piece of information I'm going to focus on is the fact Denver gets 8 nineteenths. Denver gets 8 nineteenths, that means that Engel and Fido together must get 11 nineteenths because they have to add up to 1. So we're only looking at 11 nineteenths. I'm going to focus on the ratio next of Engel to Fido. So it's 9 to 5. And let's have a look and see, um, well, first of all, how many parts are all together. So 9 plus 5, which is 14 parts. So there are 14 parts in total, and the share that they get is 11 over 19. So what I'm going to do is to find out what fraction one of those parts is worth by dividing 11 over 19 by 14. So each part is worth, and I'm just going to keep this into my calculator, 0 0.041 blah blah blah. And we're asked to find FIDO share. Well, FIDO has five parts. So FIDO has five parts, each of them worth 0 0.041 blah blah blah. I've kept it in my calculator to keep the accuracy. And when I do that, I get 0 0.206 blah blah blah. And we're asked to um, work it out as a percent, so I'm just going to times that by 100. So we have 20.676 blah 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 percent, and it wants it round to the nearest percent, so that would be 20 percent. Oh, actually, it would be 21 percent because this would round it up, so 21 percent. So what we do is we notice that um, to get this 10, we add the 3 and the 7. To get this 17, we add the 7 and the 10. And to get this 27, we add the 10 and the 17. Whenever we have this kind of sequence, it's called a Fibonacci sequence. You essentially add the previous two terms to get to the next term. And so what we need to do is just simply add the 17 and the 27. When you do that, you get 44. So our next term is 44. To answer this question, we need to, first of all, realize what the area of a trapezium is. And to find the area of a trapezium, we do half A plus B times H. Now we're going to fill in the bits that we know. Now we're given the area in the question which is 4.05. We are given the one of the bases. So we're going to call that, I don't know, B or A. doesn't really matter. Let's call this side A and this side B. So it's going to be X, because X is what A is, plus 1.7. And the height is going to be at right angles to the boot two bases, the two parallel sides, which is 2.7. Okay, let's get our lines in so we can work this out. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to divide by the 2.7 because we've got that times 2.7 on the right hand side. So divide both sides by 2.7 and that's going to give us 1.5 and we're just going to have this half brackets x plus 1.7 then we're going to times both sides by 2. And the reason is that this is times by a half there. And to get rid of a half, to get rid of a times half, we times it by 2. So times this side by 2, and times this side by 2. That's going to give us 3. And that will just get rid of the half. So it would be x plus 1.7. Then finally, we're going to take away that 1.7. And that will give us 1.3 equals x, or x equals 1.3. We need to first of all work out the theoretical probability. And to do that we do the successful outcomes over the total number of outcomes. So here we're asked it lands on a red is successful, so that's going to be 15 over the total amounts, so that would be 40 plus 30 plus 15, which is 85. Okay, now to find the expected amount, it's just the theoretical probability, which is 15 over 85,
times the amount of trials where it says it's spun 500 times. So we just go times it by 500. And we get the answer of 88.235, blah, blah, blah. And we're always going to round that down. Okay, so if it's 88.9, we're always going to round it down to 88. Only when it gets to 89 do we write 89. So our answer is that we're expecting roughly 88. Integer just means whole number. So we're looking for all the whole numbers that satisfy these two inequalities. Well, the first inequality says that it has to be greater than 3. So the smallest number that is greater than 3 is 4. The second uh, inequality says it has to be less than or equal to 8. So I'm just going to keep going till I get to a number that is less than or equal to 8. It can't be 9 because 9 is not less than or equal to 8. So our answer is 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. So to find the area of a rectangle we do length times uh, the width. So here to find the area we will do the 10 times the whole of the 10t plus 4. And to show that we're doing the whole of it we put it in brackets. So a different way of writing that is 10 brackets 10t plus 4. And whichever method you use to expand brackets, feel free to do it here. I'm going to just do the grid method, but whatever whatever method you um, prefer. Actually, I don't need the... I've done too many here. Let's get rid of that. So we've got 10 times 10t plus 4. So and we're timesing them. So 10 times 10t... 10 times 10 is 100, so it would be 100t. 10 times 4 is 40. So our answer will be 100t plus 40. So we're going to start by understanding that all lines form uh, or can form an equation y equals mx plus c, with m being the gradient and c being the y-intercept. It says here the gradient is minus 2, so we've already got a bit of a head start with this, but we don't know what the y-intercept is. So we're going to use this first set of coordinates to work out what the y-intercept is. So y is minus 31 and x is 15. And we're going to use this to solve and find out what c is. So first thing I'm going to do is, well I'll just tidy this up, 2 times 15 is 30, so minus 30 plus c. And I'm just going to add 30 to both sides to get c on its own. So that would be minus 1 equals c. So c is minus 1. So we now know that the equation is y equals minus 2x minus 1. And we're told that the y is minus 37. And we're looking for the x value, which they've called w. So let's get our solving lines in. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is add 1 to both sides. And so it would be minus 36 equals minus 2x. I'm going to now times, or uh, we'll divide everything by minus 2. And a negative divided by a negative is positive. 36 divided by 2 is 18. And then obviously that gets rid of the coefficient in the x, so it's just x. So x equals 18. So the x value is 18, and the x value is the w value. So w is 18. So we've got to find the multipliers for the first and the second year. So for the first year, we start off with 100%. And it's increased, so it's gone up by 5.6%. Uh, and so that would be 105.6%. Find that as a multiplier, so 105.6. We just divide by 100 to find it as a multiplier. 1.056. And for the second year, again, we start off with 100%. We always start off with 100%. And we're going to increase it by 3.1%. So that's going to be 103.1%. Make that into a multiplier. So 103.1 divided by 100. And that would be 1.031. So we've got our two multipliers here and here. And we've got the amount, which is 500. So we do 500, and we're going to times it by the first multiplier to increase it by 5.6%, and times it by the second multiplier 
to increase it by 3.1%. When we do that, we get uh, 544.367, blah, blah, blah. And so when we round that to two decimal places, because it's money, it's going to be 544.37. Now, between A and B, the shapes haven't changed size, so it's not an enlargement. They haven't rotated or they haven't mirrored. They've just moved. And the word we use for that is translation. So this has been a translation. And for a translation, we need to find out how far right they've gone and how far up they've gone. So we pick a point that we know on both shapes, and I'm going to pick the top left. And we count how many jumps we jump to the right. So one two, three. So we do three jumps to line it up with the other one. So there's a three at the top to say three to the right. And then we count how far up we have to go. So one, two, three, four. Now we've actually had to go down. And whenever you go down, it's like having minus up. Okay, down is minus up. So it's going to be minus four because there were four jumps. To find average speed, we do the total distance and we divide it by the total time. Now, in this question, we've got a bit of an issue because the question wants kilometers per hour, but the um, units are given to us in meters and minutes. So we just need to do some basic convert conversions. So 1080 meters is going to be 1.08 kilometers because there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer. So all we need to do is just divide the meters by 1,000. Uh, minutes are a little bit trickier. To get from minutes to hours, all we need to do is divide by 60. And so when you divide that by 60, you get 0.2 hours. So we're going to put the um, kilometers at the top, 1.08. And we're going to divide that by the hours, which is 0.2. When you do that, you get 5.4. So our answer to two decimal places will be 5.40. Whenever you have um, a, a one-digit number or a one decimal place number, but you're asked to round it to two decimal places, you should really put a zero on the end, which is what we've done. So we're going to start just by writing this out. So m equals 7 brackets x minus 10. And we're going to put our solving lines in. And I'm going to start by um, expanding the brackets. And we don't need to. We could divide both sides by 7. But I think this is a bit a bit easier. And we're going to subtract, uh, or we're going to add 70 to both sides. So we're trying to get x as the subject. So we're trying to get x on its own. And we're next going to um, divide both sides by 7. So we have m plus 70, all of that over 7 equals x. So x equals m plus 70 over 7. So this question says that Adrian... Ben and Charlie have some sweets, and the ratio of Adrian to Ben to Charlie is 9 to 6 to 13. But it also says that Charlie got 56 more sweets than Adrian. So there's 56 more sweets. Well, looking at the actual um, parts of the ratio, there are four more parts. So plus four parts, which represents plus 56 sweets. So the four extra parts are worth 56 sweets. So four parts are worth 56 sweets. So one part would be 56 divided by four, which is 14 sweets. So all we need to do now is work out how many parts there are. Well, there are 9 plus 6 plus 13 parts, uh, which is 28. 
and each part is worth 14 sweets. So the total number of sweets will be 28 times 14. So 28 times 14 is 392. So angles on a point add up to 360 and we are given the values of the angles but in terms of R. So we know that R plus 9R plus 20 will equal 360. So we've got uh, an equation here we can solve. So first of all let's add the R's together and so that will be 10R plus 20 equals 360. Then we're going to subtract the 20 from both sides. So we have 10R equals 340. And then we're going to divide by 10 both sides. So we have R equals 34. So our answer is 34. To prove triangle congruence, um, you're going to have one of four answers. You're either going to have RHS, SSS, angle angle side or angle side angle and the last one side angle side so those are our options so we've got to figure out what we have in this question well we have a right angle so an angle or right angle we've got a side which is actually the hypotenuse because we know the hypotenuse is opposite the right angle and then we just have another side now it's not going to be SSS because we don't have three sides. We do have um, an, a side and an angle and a side, but the two sides are not next to the angle, so it's not going to be that one. And we don't have two angles, so it's not going to be this one. So the last one is RHS, which is right angle, which we have, hypotenuse, which we have, and side. To work out the mass, we will need to find the density and the volume. Density is given to us in the question, but volume isn't. So we need to work out what the volume of this cuboid is. So the volume is just the 33 times the 7 times the 22. So that would be 5,082. And that would be centimetres cubed. And we need to write down the formula for density. So density is the mass divided by the volume. So um, rearrange this to get mass on its own because that's the thing we're looking for. So mass equals density times volume. Density is given to us in the question as 2.1 grams per centimeters cubed times that by the 5082 for the volume and we get the answer of 10,672 and then we are we that will give us grams because our density is in grams so that is grams but the answer is asking for kilograms so to convert that to kilograms we just divide by a thousand and we get 10.672 then we need to round that to two decimal places, and so that would be 10.67 kilograms. There are two shapes we need to find the volume of. There's this cylinder here and this hemisphere here. Um, so we might as well start with this cylinder. And the formula for the volume is pi times r squared times height. So it's um, the radius is 9, so 9 squared times the height, which is 30. And when we work that out, we get 7,634.070, blah, blah, blah. Next is the hemisphere. To find the volume of the hemisphere, well, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds times pi times r cubed. But because it's a hemisphere, we just times that by a half. So it's half times 4 thirds times pi times r, which is the radius, which is 9 cubed. And that gives us 1,526.814, blah, blah, blah. And so the total volume is 
uh, 7,634.070 blah 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 plus the 1,526.814 blah 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 which equals 9,160.884 blah 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 it says it wants it to two decimal places so when we round that we get 9,160.88 so we've got to first of all realize that these triangles are similar, so we can work up the scale factories. We need two corresponding sides, which I'm just going to pick these top ones, and we're going to work out the scale factor from those. Now, scale factor is how to get from the smaller to the bigger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 91 divided by 13, which is 7. So we know we times 7 to get from the small to the big. Now here we've got a problem because we're actually going from the big to the small, and when we go uh, the opposite way around, so instead of times 7, we're going to divide by 7. So on our calculator, we do 126 divided by 7, and we get the answer 18. To find an error interval, what we need to do is find the smallest and largest that a number can be. So I start by just drawing a quick number line, and we put our number in the middle, which is 89.6. Now we're looking to the nearest tenth, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the next number down and the next number up in 10. So the next number down would be 89.5. The next number up would be 89.7. Now the bounds, the upper and lower bound, the maximum and minimum number it could be before rounding, are going to be at the halfway points. So here and here. And so all we need to do is work out what those numbers are. So halfway between 89.5 and 89.6 is 89.55 and halfway between 89.6 and 89.7 is 89.65 so those are going to be our lower and upper bounds but how do we show it as an error interval well we put t in the middle because it tells us that t is representing the time and we show it with inequalities now the number can be 89.55, but it can't be 89.65 because that would round to 89.7. So we say everything that's less than but not equal to. Y is inversely proportional to X means that Y is proportional to 1 over X. And I'm going to change that for an equal sign by timesing the right hand side by K. And K represents our constant. And we're told that when x is 5, y is 10.8. So I'm going to fill those in. I'm going to substitute those in to be able to find out what k is going to be. So it'll be k over 5. And we're going to be solving this. Let's get my lines in. And solve it, I just times by the bottom of the fraction. So times both sides by 5. And we're going to end up with uh, 50.4 is equal to k. So k is 50.4. I'm going to rewrite this equation here, but we know what k is. It's 50.4. We're asked to find the value of x when y is 9. So we've got 9 equals 50.4 over x. And whenever in this situation here where we've got the unknown at the bottom of a fraction and we've got it equal to a number, what you can do here is actually just swap these around. We're t effectively, we're timesing both sides by x and dividing both sides by 9. But it does really help us out here because it just says that x is equal to 50.4 over 9. We can just do that on the calculator and it gives us 5.6. So here we're given a standard form number and we're asked to make it an ordinary number, which is just a number you type into the calculator. So we're going to start off by writing the decimal, which is 6.2, and we're going to shift that decimal point somewhere that it will be the actual number rather than standard form anymore. First thing to point out is we look at the power. If it's positive, it means that our ordinary number is going to be a big number. If it's negative, it means it's going to be a very small number. Since this is positive, we know it's going to be a big number. So we're going to do four jumps because there's a power of four to the right to make it a big number. So one, two, three, four. So the decimal point is going to be here. And we're going to fill in the jumps with zeros. So zero, zero, zero. 
So our new number is going to be 62 with three zeros, or 62,000. Now it's important to realize that we're actually shifting the numbers, not the decimal point, but it's a lot easier to move the decimal point in our working out. So we've got to first of all understand what standard form is, and standard form is a number that is between 1 and 10, but not including 10, times 10 to the power of another number. So to find out what the number is going to be for our standard form, we're going to just write down the decimal first, so 0 0.098. And we've got to put a decimal point in somewhere to make this a number between 1 and 10. So if I put it in here, that would make it 9.8, and we're ignoring the, the, the zeros to the left-hand side. So we know that our standard form is going to start off with 9.8 times 10 to the power of something. Now this times 10 is always going to be there. It's never divided by 10 or anything like that. It's always times 10. Next, we've got to find out what the power is going to be. So first of all, if it's a small number, if it's a number less than 1, which this is, it's a small number, it's going to be a negative power. And the next thing we do is work out how many jumps we have to do. So it would be 1, 2 jumps between where the decimal point was and where it is now. So two jumps means it's going to be to the power of minus two. To find the perimeter of this sector, we've got to first of all find out the length of the arc, which will be this part here. And the formula for arc length is first of all, we find out the fraction of the circle we have. So we put the angle over 360, and that will tell us the fraction of the um, circle that the sector is. And then all we do is we times that by the circumference, which is pi d. And so uh, that's going to be 49 over 360 times pi times, and the diameter would be twice the radius. The radius is 7, so it would be times 14. When we do all of that, we get 5.986, blah, blah, blah. But that is not the perimeter yet. Perimeter needs to include ooh, the right ones. Needs to include these parts here. So the perimeter will be the 5.986 plus a radius plus another radius. And when we do that, we get 19.986. Blah blah blah, and we want to round it to two decimal places, so that would be 19.99 centimeters. To find the probability that James will read on both days, we start here and we just draw down the read path, and then we go down the read path again. So the outcome here will be well, will give us the probability that James will read and the read. And to work out what the total probability is, well, the first one says read on Saturday, so that would be 11 over 13. The second one is read on Sunday, so that would be 9 over 10. And the word and in probability means times. So we're going to do 11 times 9, which is 99, and 13 times 10, which is 130. So our answer will be 99 over 130. This question relies on the fact that you know what the equation of a circle is. And the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Now r is the radius of the circle. So when I rewrite this and I write it, with our 16 there, we can actually rewrite 16 as 4 squared. Okay, Comparing this equation to this equation, we can see that r is 4. Now, this equation, the x squared plus y squared equals r squared, gives a circle with the center at 0, 0, at the origin. So, it means that the radius will be 4, so the circle will go all the way up here, all the way across here, all the way down here, and all the way across here. Now, I am really, really bad at drawing circles, and so what 
I would recommend you do is use a compass and measure out four and join these up. I'm going to try my best. I, I don't have a compass that works with this um, graphics tablet, but I'm going to try and draw somewhat of a circle. There we are. That's probably the best circle I'm going to draw. So what you do is you just get a compass and put the point at zero, and then you'd um, measure out four uh, units. So measure it between the zero and the four, and then just draw a perfect circle round. We've got to first of all work out how many jumps there is between our shape and the center enlargement. So I'm going to pick a point at the top of our shape, and we can see that there are two jumps to the left, and one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got to go two and then six. And the reason we do this is we're looking at a scale factor of negative two, which means we're going to go through the center of enlargement. And what that means is we're going to do two left and six down another two times because it's negative two. So we're going to go one and two, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that would be a scale factor of minus one if I plotted that point. We're at minus two, so we're going to go another two, one, two, and another six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So our new coordinate is down there. And we can go ahead and do this for the other three coordinates. I'm going to do it for the bottom left point. So we go one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, so the coordinate's going to be there. Now I can do it for the third one, or I can just kind of work out where it's going to be. Um, because if I draw in this shape, well, we've got the two coordinates here. So it's kind of on the um, y axis, you can't really see it too well. But we know the other one is going to be uh, four to the left, because on our original image, it's two to the right. So a scale factor of minus 2 would be, instead of 2 to the right, if you negate that, it's going to be left. And if you times it by 2, it's going to be 4. And let's just draw in our last part of it. And that's going to be our new um, triangle there. And it says to label, label it B. So we're just going to put B on it. So when we find the mean of something, we add the elements together and we divide them by the amount of elements. So here we've got three elements. So what we're going to do is add these together and then divide by three. Now the problem is that the um, denominators are not the same, so we can't add them yet. Um, but they're all factors of 45. So we're going to times the top and bottom of the first one by 9. So we end up with 9k over 45. Uh, times the top and bottom by 3, and so it would be 3 brackets k plus 1 over 45, and the last one is over 45, so we don't need to do anything for that. Then we can just add the numerators together, and I'm just going to expand the bracket here, so it's 3k plus 3 plus k plus 4, and then all of that over 45. And we're going to do 9k plus 3k plus k, which is going to be 13k. And then 3 plus 4, which is just 7 over 45. So the sum of them is 13k plus 7 over 45. So to work out the um, mean, we need to divide it by 3. But instead of writing divide by 3, we know KFC, keep flip change. If you have a division, you keep the first fraction, you change the divide into a times, and you flip the second fraction. So a different and easier way of writing that is times one third. So here we just keep the uh, numerator the same because we're timesing it by one. And then the bottom we just times by the three, which would be 135. So our answer is 13k plus 7 over 135. So we're going to go through one way in which you can do this question. With um, circle theorems, often there are multiple different approaches. And so if you do a slightly different method, but you've written down all the working and you're happy with it and you get the same answer, 
it's probably fine. Um, just don't forget with these, always, always show every step of your working out because normally, say, there's three marks for this question, one will be for the answer and two will be for the working out. So the first thing I notice with this um, question is that we have a lovely triangle coming off a tangent and whenever we have that the angle on the outside here is equal to the angle on the opposite side of the triangle so this is going to be 44 here I'm just going to remove all of that and so this is going to be 44 degrees here so angle B F D equals 44 degrees and the reason you need to give is the alternate segment theorem and you have to use those words otherwise you won't get the marks now next I notice that we've got a set of parallel lines here and we've got a line going through them and so the 44 degrees there is going to be equal to this one here and so this is going to be 44 degrees so we say angle um, F D E equals 44 degrees and the reason this time is alternate angles put the e in angles and again you have to use the word alternate okay uh, next thing I notice is that um, we have uh, an isosceles triangle here here and here and the bottom two angles in isosceles, assuming that it's upright, are always equal. So this is going to be 44 degrees here. So angle um, E, F, D is also 44 degrees. And again, we have to just say that it's an isosceles triangle. Okay, just highlight the fact it's an isosceles triangle. Okay, uh, next thing we're going to work out is this one here. And it's just angles in a triangle. So angle F, E, D is going to be 180. Take away the 44 plus the 44. And the reason is um, angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. And so 180 take away the 44 plus the 44 is 92, 92 degrees. And finally, <laughs> took us a while to get there, but finally we can work out what this angle is because in total all four corners of this quadrilateral here are touching the circle, so it's a cyclic quadrilateral and so angle uh, what's it called in the question angle F B D is going to equal 180 take away 92 and again we have to show the reason of the fact it's a cyclic quadrilateral And so 180 take away 92 is going to be 88 degrees. So our answer will be 88 degrees. So the first thing to notice with this question is we've got an isosceles triangle between O, B and A because these are both radii. And so what we can do is we can find this length here by or this angle here by doing 180 take away the 40 which equals 140 degrees and because it's no isosceles we do 140 divided by 2 which is 70 degrees so we know this is going to be 70 degrees here and whenever you write down working out like this so the first one would be 180 take away 40 you need to write down why so you put in brackets angles in a triangle and then the second one you would put in brackets isosceles triangle. That's why that's 70. That's why we halve the 140. Okay, so the big thing here is that we can now work out what this angle is. 
This angle is the 10 degrees plus the 70 degrees, which is 80 degrees. And we use a circle theorem here called the alternate segment theorem. And what the alternate segment theorem states is if you've got a tangent and you have a triangle coming off it, which we do here, then the angles here and here will be equal and also the angles here and here will be equal. It's basically the angle between the triangle and the tangent and the opposite side of the triangle. An alternate segment theorem is quite hard to spot sometimes. So we, we know that x is going to be 80 because it's going to be equal to the angle at CBA. And what we must write down is alternate segment theorem. You must have those three words written down and it's crucial that you write them down um, in that order and you don't call it an alternate segment or a segment theorem. It has to be those three words. And in all mark schemes, it will have it will have those three words written down. And normally there's a mark for a non-circle theorem um, proof, so angles in a triangle or angles in an isosceles, or both of them for this question, and then a mark for the circle theorem itself. So make sure you write down all the reasons. So to find the shaded part of this diagram, we need to first of all work out the volume of the smaller cone which is at the top, then work out the volume of the larger cone, which is the whole cone shown, and then take them away from each other. So the radius for the smaller cone is 4, and the height is 5. And the radius for the larger cone is 20, and the height is the 20 plus the 5, so it would be 25. So I'm just going to label them A and B. And so why don't we work out the volume for B first. And the formula for the volume of a cone is a third pi r squared h, with h being the perpendicular height. So it's a third times pi times 20 squared times 25, which is going to be 10,471.975, blah, blah, blah. We're going to work out the volume for A. And this time it will be a third times pi times the radius now is 4, and the height is 5. So that will be 83.775, blah, blah, blah. So to work out the shaded bit, we're just going to do the volume for B, take away the volume for A. So it's going to be 10,471.975 take away 83.775 and all those I'm going to keep in the calculator to keep the accuracy and that gives us 10,388.199 blah 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 and to two decimal places it's going to be 10,388.20 so at the point on the graph where x is 12 um, this point here and what you need is a ruler and what you're going to do is rest it on so it becomes the tangent of that point so I'm going to try my best to do it here I'm just going to draw it out and this is going to be my ruler and I'm just going to move this into place so we want that to be a tangent at x equals 12 which is about here and then what you do is work out what the um, gradient of that line is. So I'm just going to draw a line across and up. And we know that gradient is the change in y over change in x. The change in y is 2. And the change in x is 1. 2 divided by 1 is just 2. So the gradient at x equals 12 is 2. Now notice it says x equals 12. It's a curve, so the gradient's constantly changing. But an estimate of the gradient at that point is roughly 2. And you, you just need to make sure you rest the ruler down 
and then until you're happy with it, draw the line like I've done with the blue line and then just work out the um, gradient of that. And if you just show all your working, show the examiner how you've come up with the value, even if your gradient's slightly off, you might still even be able to get full marks on some, some of the papers, if not one out of the two marks maybe. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMath site. OnMath is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing.